today. Um, we'll start with a welcome and introduction from Treasurer Henry Beck. Um, Abe Wapner from the Coalition for Green Capital will give an overview of green banks and what's happening at the federal level. Steve Klemmer from the Union of Concerned Scientists will share what's happening in Maine with clean energy finance and some of the details uh, with why this is needed. Um, Paige Ziegler and Ann Carney will have both sponsored bills on, on the Green Bank. And so we'll hear, hear from each of them. Um, in Representative Ziegler's bill, uh, the Green Bank will be situated underneath Efficiency Main Trust as a new initiative. Um, and Michael Stoddard, the Executive Director of Efficiency Main, will speak about their role. Um, and then I will close things out with an overview of some of the next steps for the legislation and how you can all help to make it a reality. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce State Treasurer Henry Beck. Well, thank you, David. Uh, and hel hello to everyone who's joined. Uh, I have the privilege of opening this event, uh, maybe sort of getting us um, fired up, which is a skill that state treasurers don't really have. So I hope you'll, you'll, you'll bear with me. Um, Last summer and fall, right in the heart uh, of the challenge the states faced in this pandemic, I became involved in this effort, uh, like everyone on this call, involved almost just as a citizen of the state um, to you know, take every step to improve and centralize a resource uh, in Maine to help businesses and consumers save money, make money, making money is okay, and take every step uh, to curb climate change. And you saw the title of the presentation, uh, uh, call it what you want, involve who you want, uh, whether it's programs we already have or having a, a standalone resource, we just have to leverage every opportunity. And so as part of my effort uh, back in the fall, I was asked to um, sort of set the stage, support the work that you've been doing, support the work of Senator Carney and Representative Ziegler uh, by uh, writing an op-ed for the Lewis and Sun Journal uh, about this work. Uh, and in that article, I, uh, I sort of mused about the role that the federal government uh, could play in our efforts and funding they could provide. Uh, and I was uh, very confident in that op-ed. Uh, personally, I was sort of hopeful, uh, but realistic. Um, like everyone, like everyone in the country, I really needed to be shown that Washington could work. Uh, and in some ways, uh, no one is more surprised and impressed than me at what uh, the president and Congress have accomplished recently with the American Rescue Plan and what I continue to be optimistic about what they can do with regard to the American Jobs Plan. Uh, that includes funding for green banking initiatives at the state level. And that sort of brings us to where we are. You know, I can be all for this and you can be all for this, uh, but we really have to uh, dig down and support the work of our legislators here in Maine influence the work in Washington. Uh, we've come very far. Uh, I don't wanna say that you know, the, the end is in sight uh, or we're almost there, but we're very much on our way. And I will su obviously support uh, your work every way that I can support Senator Carney, support Representative Ziegler. Um, you know, I can't speak for Governor Mills, uh, by the way, but I know, I think we all sort of seen, she believes very much in, in good policy believes in good policy on climate change. Uh, and this is good policy. And um, we'll keep going with our event today. I hope to be with you to get all this done. Thank you, Henry. We, we appreciate your support um, and, uh, and your work on this. Uh, next up, we have Abe Wapner from the Coalition for Green Capital. And uh, Abe, I, I think Abe wanted to share some slides. So I'll let you take it from here. Oh, great. Thanks, David. Um, let me see if I can't get my slides up on everyone's screen here. Um, is that oh, probably put it in presentation mode? Is that coming through for everybody? Great. Um, so wanted to talk to you all a little bit about kind of green banks generally, and then some of the exciting activity at the federal level, which Treasurer Beck alluded to. Um, my name is Abe Wapner. I'm with the Coalition for Green Capital. We're a nonprofit that's been around about 10 years that exists to expand the amount of financing into the clean energy space, um, historically through the creation of institutions known as green banks. So 
We work all over the country as well as internationally, and we are super excited to see so much activity going on in the state of Maine. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit today about some of the exciting things coming down the pipe that uh, could mean uh, further impact here in, in the state. So first off, I just want to set the stage with kind of what is a green bank. And this is the definition that uh, we like to use at CGC. Um, green banks are mission-driven institutions that use innovative financing to accelerate investment in an equitable and prosperous clean energy and climate transition. And since I know you can all read, I should maybe explain a little bit of what I mean when I say those words. Um, so mission-driven institutions mean that green banks really uh, work to accomplish the goals set by the state. So that's climate goals, that's um, environmental justice goals. Uh, green banks use public capital or mission-driven capital to crowd in private uh, capital and um, accelerate investment into projects across the clean energy space. Like I, I alluded to, green banks are really focused on an equitable transition. And I think especially in the lens of the Justice 40 initiative, um, that's kind of launching on, on Capitol Hill right now. Um, green banks are getting a lot of spotlight as a, a potential tool to um, fuel a, a more just transition as we think about um, where we're going on um, with regards to climate. So, you know, what is the green bank model? Um, it's been, like I said, we've been around about 10 years and the green banks have been launched all across the country, everywhere from Rhode Island to Hawaii. Um, at both the state and the local level. level. Um, they've given about $5 billion of investment and they've created thousands of jobs. Um, and, uh, you know, the model's largely been proven to be a success for a number of different states, um, working on, you know, different impacts as far ranging as community solar to on-bill financing. Um, so, one of the most exciting things about working in the green bank world right now is that there is uh, been growing support over the past year and a half or so for a um, clean energy and sustainability accelerator at the federal level. Um, this initiative has bipartisan support um, and would be, um, as included in President Biden's plan, a $27 billion uh, institution at the national level that would then fund state and local green banks in their job to uh, expand access to financing at the, the state and local level. Um, the initiative was included in legislation that passed the House twice in 2020, um, and it's been reintroduced as part of the Clean Future Act with, like I said, bipartisan support. So we're very excited um, to see so much momentum on Capitol Hill, uh, and we think there's a you know large chance this will be included in the you know infrastructure package that would be passing towards the end of the summer, early fall. Um, and a number of, of national NGOs uh, that have all kind of signed on to support the accelerator. And we're really excited to see that support growing every day. So um, we are loving the momentum. Um, we're loving the bipartisan support. And we're really excited to see this idea getting so much traction. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what the accelerator is and what that might mean for Maine. Um, so the Green Bank or the, the accelerator itself would partner with state green banks to deploy capital at the local level. Um, it's, its mandate by Congress is broad in that it's able to target a lot of different areas of the clean energy space. So everything from sustainable agriculture to renewable power. Um, and the, but the, the main deployment mechanism is uh, the state and local institutions like the one under consideration for creation in, in Maine. Um, like I mentioned earlier, equity is a huge part of this transition as we see it. And uh, about 40% of the investment from the accelerator would be required to go to disadvantaged communities um, to help create jobs and fuel businesses that uh, focus on, on those uh, environmental justice communities. Um, so in order to get that capital out, the accelerator has been, you know, partnering would, would partner with green banks all across the country. And you can see that um, in, in green, we've got states that already have green banks. Um, and in blue, there's a lot of different states that are considering green banks or thinking about how to get one up and rolling in, in preparation for, for federal funds. So Maine's in really good company um, and, and we're excited to, to see the momentum uh, building. So 
that's the update on the, the federal side and um, the kind of Green Bank 101. Uh, so David, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, pass it back to you. Great, thank you, Abe. Um, and I uh, just wanted to make sure everyone knows that uh, Maine Representative Shelley Pingree has co-sponsored the bill in the house, uh, which we're very excited about. Um, so next on the agenda, we have Steve Clemmer to speak about what's happening in, in Maine. Um, and Steve is with the Union of Concerned Scientists. So Steve, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thanks a lot, David. Let me share my screen here. Can everybody see that? Can you see that, David? Yeah, okay, great. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, thanks everyone. Good afternoon and thanks for inviting me to speak on this panel. Uh, for those of you that don't know UCS, we are the nation's leading science-based nonprofit organization. We have more than a half a million supporters nationally, including about 2,700 in Maine. And my remarks today are gonna to be based on a report I co-authored in 2016 about creating a green bank in Maine and some more recent discussions that have occurred over the past couple of years. Um, I'd have to say I'm really excited, um, given that we wrote this report five years ago, that this is really starting to come to fruition in Maine. Another um, important aspect is that um, I was a member of the Energy Working Group for the Maine Climate Council. And I, one of the recommendations that I really advocated for was to establish a green bank in Maine. And thankfully, um, it was included as an option for consideration in the final report from, from the Maine Climate Council. So I'd like to start the presentation with, with the big picture um, by highlighting four key numbers to help everyone understand the enormous challenge and the magnitude of investment that's needed to achieve Maine's climate and energy goals. First number is 80%. That's um, Maine's emission reduction target by 2050, um, which you can see over there on the right in the chart. Um, there's also an interim target of 45% below 1990 levels by 2030 and also reaching carbon neutrality by 2050 or net zero emissions. The 80% um, is also Maine's renewable electricity standard by 2030, which is one of the highest in the country. Um, and it goes up to 100% goal by 2050. Um, Maine also has targets for distributed solar and offshore wind, as you probably know. The second number is 30%. Um, Maine has energy efficiency goals to reduce electricity and natural gas use 30% by 2020, heating oil use 30% by 2030. Um, in the Climate Council report, you'll also see that Maine has a goal of installing 100,000 heat pumps by 2025 and weatherizing 35,000 homes and businesses. The next big number is 40 to $50 billion. And that's the investment that some studies have shown might be needed in Maine over the next 30 years to, to achieve some of these goals. And um, that's really, a, that's around $1.5 billion a year, which is a lot of money. The good news and the fourth number is 4.4 billion. That's, that's the amount of money Maine spends on imported fossil fuels every year out of a total bill of about $6.2 billion in 2018. And so the good news is that by redirecting a portion of that money um, to spending it on um, clean energy, we can actually create jobs, reduce emissions and lower energy bills all at the same time. It's also really important to put these numbers into the context with the much higher cost of climate change impacts that we would see in Maine if we don't make these investments. And some of those costs are estimated in the, the Maine Climate Council report. So that's where a green bank comes in. Uh, while you know, this, this amount of money I'm talking about doesn't all need to come from a green bank, um, in my view, and I think Abe touched on this as well, most green bank programs are really targeted at populations and sectors that have limited um, access or, to capital. And those would include things like ho um, homeowners, renters, small businesses, small industrial facilities, it could include farms, nonprofits, institutions, and so forth. Um, while clean energy investments um, are needed in all sectors of Maine's economy, um, I really think that the, the money should be focused on the biggest bang for the buck. And so since most of Maine's carbon emissions come from transportation and home heating, 
switching from oil to zero carbon electricity in those sectors is one of the key strategies for achieving Maine, Maine's emission reduction targets. And you can see some of the, the key investments that, that would, could be made there. And each of these investments, it's important to know, has upfront costs in the thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. But once again, most of those investments can be repaid over time through um, savings on energy bills. And finally, um, you know, UCS is very supportive of um, using funding like this for climate resilient infrastructure. And, um, you know, that, that could, uh, that's something that's, really, that's talked about in the, the Climate Council report um, as well. And, um, you know, that can be through different types of funding and different types of programs. But as Abe was saying, the Federal Accelerator Program can be potentially used for that purpose. And in terms of the types of products and services that green banks typically provide, um, one is credit enhancements, um, that, and these can help reassure private lenders. Green banks can occupy a first loss position or create low loss reserve funds are some, some approaches for that. They also um, are commonly do warehousing and securitization where they aggregate loans and sell those uh, collections as securities. There's also direct lending, um, which is more like the traditional types of consumer business loans and Efficiency Maine does some of this um, currently, but um, obviously those programs could be expanded. And then there's other ki kinds of structured products and financing tools. One that I would especially highlight is property assessed clean energy financing, which is a bill that's currently in uh, the Maine legislature that, that we strongly support. I, I think there's been one hearing on that. Um, and also just um, providing technical expertise, uh, things like underwriting support um, for the two traditional lenders, and that can help improve the knowledge of the new technologies and help lower some of the risks. It's also um, really important um, from our standpoint that uh, green banks should be designed to be equitable and provide benefits to all residents, including low-income households, disadvantaged communities, and rural areas. And as Abe was touching on, that's a really central component of the federal green bank that requires at least 40% of the money be targeted in that way. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Maine is spending money on low income households. Efficiency Maine has programs, CCI has programs. And of course, there's the, the state weatherization assistance programs and things like that. But, but these programs can really be expanded. And there's a lot of great um, examples from around the country. I, I list three here from Baltimore, Portland, Oregon, and the Connecticut Green Bank. But um, Abe's uh, uh, Coalition for Green Capital has a lot more as well that, that could be uh, replicated and emulated in Maine. So in terms of funding sources, um, you know, we've heard the Abe's talk about the federal funding sources, which we're um, very excited about and hope, hope that comes to fruition. Um, there, there are a series of existing sources. Many of these are used currently to fund efficiency main programs. I'm not gonna run through all these, but um, these are sources of money that are currently in place. Um, in terms of the new sources, um, obviously the federal green bank would be, a, it would be huge to be able to leverage that money. But um, you know, if, if, um, if that doesn't happen, which um, would be unfortunate, um, there are other sources of money that could be tapped into. And I think it's really important that Maine thinks about diversifying its, its funding sources. And so bonding is another um, possibility, on-bill financing, as I already mentioned, PACE. Um, institutional investors are really a huge source of capital that could be tapped into. And, and Abe's, uh, Abe has some examples of that as well. And obviously a fee on CO2 emissions from oil and gas. I know that's, that's kind of hard to get through politically, but that could also be a, a, a very large source of money. Uh, in terms of hosts and partners for the Green Bank, I think, you know, in our 2016 report, we, we definitely thought Efficiency Maine was the best entity to do this. I think the, the, the bill from Representative Ziegler identified Efficiency Maine as well, and we hear more from Michael Stoddard later in the call. But I also just wanted to highlight there's lots of other entities that could be partners um, in, the, in this work as well in Maine that, that, that implement programs um, like this, and um, as well as just kind of a broader banking and financial community as well. 
So I want to just end with this slide. This is just um, an illustrative example. I don't want you to, don't put too much emphasis on it, but as part of the, the 2016 paper that we developed, we also developed a spreadsheet tool that would allow um, different states to estimate what the impacts might be from implementing a green bank. So I just um, put, uh, made an assumption of a, of a $50 million initial capitalization, which essentially um, is about the size of Efficiency Maine's program. So think about doubling what Efficiency Maine is currently doing. And that could leverage about a billion dollars of cumulative investment over 15 years by having money come back into the bank, recycling the money in the loans that come from uh, the repayments. And that, um, you know, we, we assume that some of it could be directed at renewables, some of it could be directed at energy efficiency and estimated that that could result in about 400 megawatts of solar, um, or, uh, nearly $120 million in annual savings on energy bills from implementing efficiency and uh, uh, nearly 740,000 tons of CO2 reduced. So I'm gonna leave it there, but be happy to answer any questions or talk more about that later, thanks. Thank you, Steve. Um, that was a great job packing a lot of information into a short presentation. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, so um, up next, we wanted to hear from the um, two legislators who have introduced bills on this on this subject. Um, so Representative Ziegler, um, I'll, I'll let you go first. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you for setting up this webinar. And I have to say I'm having problems with my internet. I'm not saying it's the opponents of the bill that are doing it, but I may disappear at some point. I want to talk about the history mostly of the bill and not the uh, nuts and bolts, because I think most people will deal with that. I first became interested in a green bank or sustainability accelerator about five years ago during a conference in Boston uh, for legislators. There was a presentation from a legislator who had introduced a similar bill out west. This was during a time in our state, maybe I'm sure some of you can remember this, when the governor was not supportive of renewable energy. I was looking forward towards a future when we would need to have more seed capital to jumpstart the projects. Besides this, the state's hesitation it appeared that banks didn't want to invest without more security due to perceived issue of risk. I also, um, I was, I wanted to allow low and middle income populations access to loans to compensate for the upfront costs. There was and still is a well-known opponent of renewable energy in the legislature. He would rise and speak in a sectorial voice saying there are no solar panels in trailer parks. That is not to say the people living in those trailer parks didn't want the panels, but it's more to say they couldn't pay the upfront costs. He complained of elitism regarding renewable energy production. The Prius crowd, he called them. I think we've all heard that too. Um, that pointed out the problems with a form of energy that was not, you know, as new getting off the ground. He could have worked on a solution with the rest of us, but he continued to point to the sense of elitism I had read about other states that had green banks and was, was impressed with what they had accomplished, both in allowing investments for projects and also loaning to communities as was talked about that were often not able to access loans. Before the next session, the 129th, I met David Gibson, who is a constituent and, and he had just returned from working and living out West. He connected me with the people who have been working on green banks who you've heard of already, uh, over the years. We, David uh, and I wrote a bill for the 129th session. Um, unfortunately, uh, during the first session, um, we were having a little trouble getting traction with it. Uh, we held it over to the second uh, year and we turned the bill into resolve, uh, which we were lucky because uh, that was right before the pandemic hit and it would have really disappeared then. Um, and this resolve was then, um, we also, when we had the bill, it did not look like we could float a bond or ever use general funds. Um, so we turned it into resolve and then the resolve went into the climate uh, council. It was absorbed uh, and it, the idea was to look for a source of funding. 
Um, but going into the 130th, uh, David and I both felt we needed to reintroduce the bill. This time the bill wasn't in search of funding, but was tying itself to a bill in the US House and Senate, which was discussed earlier. Um, also, we were not looking up, uh, looking to set up a new group to administer the funds. We had done that in the first bill, but we wanted to use Efficiency Maine to do that work. Um, and you might ask, why do we need this bill? We need this bill because when that money flows from the feds, we need to immediately be able to administer. So if we have the bill, setting up a structure to do it, we can move forward. Um, as of today, I have not heard from the revisor's office regarding the bill. When I hear from them, we have three days to either revise or accept the wording and also to find co-sponsors. It appears that this bill will have broad bipartisan support. Uh, that said, since the um, biennial uh, budget bill, I hope that that continues uh, uh, and I'm hoping that we continue to have uh, bipartisan support. We're also looking forward and hoping for support from the community, from labor to finance, from all income levels. This bill allows efficiency main great leeway in how to use those funds. And as I am a member of the Energy, Utilities and Technology Committee, along with the Environment and Natural Resource Committee, in the legislature, I'm aware of the changing landscape in the renewable energy market, as I'm sure all of you here are. Um, but this is necessary infrastructure if we want to mitigate climate disruption. And as it's been said many times before, lower Maine's energy costs by producing as much as we can within the state's borders. And again, thank you for setting up the webinar. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them if I can. Great, thank you, Representative Ziegler. Um, and up next, we have Senator Carney, who has also introduced the bill. Um, so I'll let you take the floor, Senator. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the conveners and the panelists for inviting me to join today. Um, I especially wanted to express thanks for all of you on the panel who have spoken to me and helped me with the resolve. So. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about the resolve. It's something that I was thinking about um, over the summer. It really crystallized for me when the week before the climate plan was released, the Climate Council was meeting and Brownie Carson issued this sort of plaintive plea about, you know, the climate plan didn't really address the financing issue. And he said, kind of with desperation in his voice, we have to figure out how to pay for this now. And so that's what this resolve does. The resolve is um, pretty straightforward. First of all, it's an emergency measure. So it will go into effect uh, 90 days after enactment if, if it is enacted. It is designed to pull together all of the key stakeholders and partners who and all of the existing expertise in Maine those stakeholders and partners will um, have a gaps analysis performed. And I wanna thank Abe Wapner for suggesting the gaps analysis. And what that does is it identifies where Maine's unmet need is for capital. So that when, as we look to implementing the climate plan, we can leverage capital and use it to meet the needs that otherwise are not going to be met. Um, a, uh, Steve Clemmer said earlier that, that his vision of a green bank really addresses those who have limited access to capital and that is indeed the, the focus of the resolve. So the resolve would then put the partners after the gaps analysis is done, would pull the partners and stakeholders together and put them to work to recommend a financing model that's specifically designed to allow Maine to pay for the, the uh, work that we need to do to implement the climate plan, basically to get where we are now, from where we are now to where we need to be in four years as outlined by the climate plan. The resolve lists specific things that the model will take into account. And that includes using public sector funds to leverage private sector investments, 
focusing on the effectiveness of the model to provide financing for the climate work we need to do relative to affordable housing, the capacity of the model to make capital available and accessible to populations with low incomes and underserved communities, the capacity of the model, and I think this is really important, to grow, uh, to grow and change over time as new opportunities for capital and new financial products arise. That's something I think that the Connecticut Green Bank has been really successful in. Uh, the, the study would also look at, the study group would look at the potential of the model to increase jobs and to raise Maine's annual earning for residents in the state who are doing this work. It would also, of course, focus on the potential of the model to really achieve the goals that are set out in the climate plan and also the more long range goals that the 129th legislature enacted to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Maine. And ultimately the objective is that this, this model, whatever is recommended by the study group would become kind of a hub for all of the expertise that Maine needs to implement the climate plan now and then uh, continue to do the work we need to do in the future. Um, I did wanna comment a little bit on the existence of Representative Ziegler's fine legislation as well as my legislation. This is not kind of an either or situation. We really need to address the, uh, understand and address the gaps we have in Maine that will prevent us from reaching the goals that are set out in the climate plan, as well as being ready to accept any federal resources that are available. I also, you know, our climate plan is called Maine Won't Wait, and that really ties into the resolve. This is a fast track uh, process for creating a model that will allow Maine to meet our climate goals. And importantly, it doesn't necessarily rely on uh, finance, finances from any particular source. The capital will come from a diverse variety of resources, not specifically tied to federal legislation because we know that in Maine, we need to meet these goals regardless of what happens federally. And I wanna thank everybody for your attention. And oh, a couple of words on the process. The bill is out for signatures. I've invited uh, Representative Ziegler to be the lead co-sponsor in the House, and I'll be turning it in on Monday. Paige, I don't know if you got my email, but um, well, check your email. <laughs> um, and yeah, and so that's the status of the bill. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. I was just gonna ask if there's a bill number yet, and it sounds like we'll have that next week. Yeah, I would um, say on Wednesday. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Senator Carney. Um, and next up, we have Michael Stoddard from Efficiency Maine, um, who under Representative Ziegler's bill will be the, the host organization that oversees the accelerator. So Michael, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, David. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, I don't have any slides. I will just uh, provide a little bit of context about what Efficiency Maine does now, how we're set up, and um, and give people hopefully a, a little framework so they could um, envision how this might work if uh, the legislation went forward and and uh, and named Efficiency Maine as the administrator. Um, that's what we do. We administer funds designed to uh, help get the marketplace over barriers to investing and installing new high efficiency equipment and clean energy equipment. So it does feel like it's a pretty good fit with a lot of the things you're hearing folks describe that we need to shift to as part of our climate action plan and also as a way generally to lower our energy costs and lower our, lower our carbon emissions as a state. Um, we are an independent quasi-state agency that was established by the legislature back in 2010. Uh, we have an independent board of trustees who are essentially stakeholders representing different customer groups and different areas of expertise. And we have a professional staff and run these energy programs to uh, help all sectors of the main economy from low income customers to uh, affordable housing to uh, small businesses, uh, medium and large businesses, and, and even the biggest manufacturers in the state to make investments and get over these various hurdles that they face to install high efficiency and lower carbon equipment. 
And uh, our, as, as Steve pointed out, our annual budget tends to come in around $50 million a year. So that just gives you a sense of scale of what we're managing in terms of programs. We also have a $20 million, uh, about $20 million in loan funds. So we, part of the reason I think that um, David and, and the bill sponsors, Representative Ziegler and, and others thought that Efficiency Maine might make sense as a place to house this would be because we've done it before and we're doing it now. So we do have some loan programs. Steve pointed out that there are some other groups in the state who also have that expertise. And, um, and so our, our experience is that when the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was passed a little over 10 years ago in the 2009 financial crisis, one of the uh, grants that came to Maine was a uh, $20 million loan fund to help fund residential energy improvements, uh, home, re residential energy improvements. And so we have used that fund over the last 10 years as a revolving loan fund. The default rates are extremely low, uh, which is a great, which is a great success for the state. Um, and we provide through uh, subcontracting, we have the underwriting and originating services, loan servicing, um, and marketing and education to try and promote that opportunity so folks are aware of it. We mostly are using those funds to support uh, weatherization projects, so home insulation projects, as well as heating system upgrades. And uh, for a period of time, we were doing uh, PV projects, rooftop PV projects. Uh, lately, we have not, but um, that is something that we have experience doing. We also have a much smaller small business loan fund, and that is focusing primarily on heat pumps and heat pump uh, and VRF systems, a form of heat pump system for larger projects that's available statewide. And then as Steve mentioned, if the CPACE program does come through, then we will uh, potentially be administering that program too. The, that's a, a kind of a very secured loan product. We have both secured and unsecured loan products. Um, they each have their strengths and weaknesses, but we have uh, experience using those things. Um, let's see, what else could I mention? Um, you know, I, I think generally we just want to know how we can be helpful with the with the uh, infrastructure that we've built, the tool that we've built that's at the disposal of policymakers to do whatever would be most helpful. We are um well familiar with the contractor community so all the builders and electricians and plumbers and uh hvac technicians and insulation businesses all those folks who need to pitch their pro projects to customers and then figure out how to help their customers get it funded we have uh, very close relations with and databases to work with uh and and connect customers to them um we did a lot of interact. We had a lot of interaction with Maine's banks and credit unions uh, when we were first setting up that loan program. We haven't had that so much in the past, but we do have good connections there. And so I think the idea of trying to leverage funds, both public funds and private funds, is something that makes a lot of sense. And I, I particularly appreciate Senator Carney's approach uh, to looking at this as sort of a methodical way to identify what it is that needs help and tailor the, the policies and the programs to provide that help in a very targeted way. And there's a lot going on that's really good already in the private sector and there's the banks and the credit unions are doing good things. Um, you know, there is more liquidity now, there's more capital available to do a lot of what is gonna be necessary. So that's, we're lucky and, we're, and interest rates are low and that's great. Uh, but as many before me have mentioned, not everyone is able to participate as easily. People face a variety of barriers, and we ought to just take a good hard look at where the need is uh, greatest and how we should design our programs and policies to try and meet that need. And I look forward to participating in that discussion. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, we appreciate you joining us today and uh, for all the work you do. Um, I know that I've taken advantage of efficiency main rebates for the insulation and heat pumps I put in my house and uh, 
yeah, there's a lot of fantastic work that's already happening in the state. Um, and, and hopefully this can build on top of that. Um, so I wanted to uh, close out the presentation today um, with an overview of the, the legislation and next steps for people, for how people can support this uh, bill moving forward. Um, and I'm sorry for those of you who are intimately familiar with the legislature, if this is uh, a little uh, mundane for you, um, but I'll try to go quickly just to make sure that everyone knows how to do this. Uh, so the next steps for the legislation, um, the bill will be released from the revisor's office with an LD number. Um, and then the committee will schedule a public hearing. Um, this bill should go to the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee, um, but it's not certain. Uh, and so if that changes, we'll make sure to let you all know. Um, and the, the legislature changed their rules last week. So there's no longer two weeks of notice required. So this could come about pretty quickly. Um, it sounds like there are some bills that have already been scheduled for next week and things like that. Um, and so again, we'll let you know the, the public hearing date and which committee it's going to. Um, after the public hearing, the committee will hold a work session to discuss any changes or amendments or uh, additional information on the bill. Um, and, and then they will have a committee vote. If the committee votes to pass the bill, there will be a vote by the full legislature. Um, and then once it passes the full legislature, both the, the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, it will be signed into law by, by Governor Mills. Um, and we have a number of supporters um, for this legislation, um, starting out with bipartisan co-sponsors in the legislature. The Environmental Priorities Coalition is a group of 32 different environmental and nonprofit organizations um, that are strong supporters of this. It's one of their priorities for the year. Um, both the city of Portland and city of South Portland are, are supporting the bill. And we have Revision Energy and a number of other businesses um, in, the, in the efficiency sector as, as well as elsewhere in the economy um, that support the bill. Um, there's, a, there's a number of organizations that have expressed their support for it, but can't officially support it until they have a final bill number and the final draft of the legislation. Um, and some of, some of the supporters include the Maine Bankers Association, the Maine Credit Union League, the Portland Chamber of Commerce, and the Maine Municipal Association. Um, and so there's a, a diverse array of supporters. Um, and we are always looking for more businesses and more organizations that want to support the bill or want to learn more about it. Um, so the best ways that any of you uh, listening to the webinar today can help uh, would be to draft testimony for the committee hearing. You could write a letter to the editor, sign on to the Sierra Club's Add Up campaign, and I'll put the link in the chat after this. Um, that is right now it's a petition to our federal legislators to encourage them to co-sponsor the federal legislation. Once we have a bill number and, and final draft of the bill in the legislature, we will pivot that to be focused on the state legislation and we'll contact everyone who's on that um, to let them know that, that the state legislation has gone out. Um, and share information with your friends and colleagues about the bill. The Environmental Priorities Coalition has a great fact sheet on this that, again, I'll share a link to that in the chat afterwards. So very quickly, um, to submit testimony on the bill, you can go to the legislature's website and on the top right corner under contact us, you can click on testimony submission. Once you're on the testimony submission page, you have to click the button for a public hearing. And then you'll select a committee, which should be the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee and the date of the hear the, that the public hearing is scheduled for. Um, once you click on the date, then a list of bills for that date will drop down. And again, we'll give you the bill number so you'll know which bill to to support and to provide comments on, and you just select the button for that particular bill number. And if you want to speak at the hearing, you can click on the button to, to present testimony live. If, if you wanna speak at the hearing, you don't have to submit written testimony, um, but if you don't wanna talk live, you can submit 
written testimony either by uh, attaching a file or by uh, drafting it directly in the text box. So they've made it really simple. It, it's gotten a lot easier to submit testimony to the legislature. Um, and we hope that you will do that. But because you have the option to upload a file, you can already go ahead and draft testimony if you know that you wanna support the bill and have some reasons uh, why you're in support. Um, this is just a screenshot of the Sierra Club add up campaign. Um, and we, we've spoken with each of our representatives and senators at the federal level. Um, and they, they, they're all familiar with this bill um, and Representative Pingree has co-sponsored it. Um, and so our, our action here in Maine, they're all very interested as the bill moves forward in the state legislature. Um, all, of, all of our federal legislation has an eye on this. Um, and so we're, we're still working to get them to all co-sponsor the bill um, as part of the infrastructure package that, uh, that uh, President Biden is moving forward. Um, I also mentioned the fact sheet that uh, the Environmental Priorities Coalition has put together. Um, and again, I'll share a link to this. Um, it's a great resource. Um, if, you're, if you're meeting with your representative or your state senator and they haven't heard about this bill, it's a great resource to describe it to them. Um, and it's also great for anyone else in the community that's not familiar with what a green bank or clean energy accelerator would do. Um, and so with that, um, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, open the floor up to any questions. Um, and I'll put those links in the chat. Um, Sydney, do I see your hand up? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So um, I live in Falmouth and I uh, started a group a year ago of just concerned, you know, neighbors and friends who want to do whatever we can in our home and garden uh, and in our lives to uh, have a positive impact. And um, the idea of a green bank is interesting to me, but I'm still not really sure what it is. I mean, right now I use a well-known bank and I'd rather put my money in a bank that invests in, you know, uh, sustainable things. Is what you're talking about today the kind of bank I could do that? Or is it completely different? Um, um, yeah, that's a great question. And unfortunately, no, um, it would not accept deposits um, from individuals. Um, it's more of an institutional level bank helping to facilitate action between other local banks. And so the idea is that it will create partnerships with local banks and credit unions. And for most of the customer level transactions of, of borrowing money for energy efficiency, that will happen through the, the existing banks in Maine, whether that's bank or savings bank or uh, credit unions or the, or the various other banks. And so the idea is that there will be an array of different partners and it will help encourage all of all of the local banks to to make loans relating to efficiency and clean energy. Okay, so right now it's probably too early to, uh, you know, tell me which bank is more likely to, um, you know, be involved. I mean, I'd love to just uh, start doing my banking with, you know, a bank who cares about what's going on environmentally, and and then tell my friends in the group. Yeah. Absolutely. And I would encourage you to go and talk to your bank and you can encourage them to support this legislation. Okay. Um, and, and that's a great right. way. Um, yeah. Thank you, okay. Sydney. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and feel free anyone to use the, the hand raise function um, or type questions in the chat. And I know um, there was one question in the chat that I saw for Senator Carney. Um, and I just wanted to check with you um, is is there an independent uh, source of funding for your resolve, um, for the study that your resolve calls for, or would that be funded by the taxpayers? Uh, thank you, David. And thanks for the question. It's, it's not, does not envision taxpayer funding. What the resolve would do is look at a diverse array of, of sources of capital. So it could even include um, federal funding that is, um, um, released as part of, of one of the uh, economic uh, stimulus plans or even the uh, federal legislation related to the accelerator. 
It can also bring in private capital, people like, and I'm um, not seeing on my screen the person who just spoke from Falmouth, but you know, private investors who are interested in really um, doing values-based investment, it could pull, pull in that kind of capital as well, as well as administering bond funds actually. Great, thank you. Um, Matt, have you been following the chat? Are there additional questions on there? I think you've gotten most of them thus far. There's a lot of good sharing of information on there. David, I did just want to raise one other thing. You gave everybody really great information about testifying. And I, I just wanted to ask Representative Ziegler if, if the EUT committee has a time limit on testimony because it's helpful for people to know how long or short their testimony needs to be. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Senator Carney. And I think we're both in agreement that most committees, um, especially the, due to the, if, if there's a large number of testimonies, you should limit it to three minutes. And I would suggest the best thing you can do as you look at your testimony is not repeat what somebody before you has said uh, but if you can, always add new information. Would you agree with that, Senator? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I do think that the three minutes is the most common um, time frame used by committees. So that's great advice. And I just posted in the chat the uh, link to the fact sheet and the link to the add up campaign um, for anyone to go on and uh, support the federal legislation. Um, are, there, are there additional questions? I know this is a complicated topic, so um, feel free to ask it, you know, any question at all. Um, And I see that Abe has included a link to the Green Bank Consortium, which is another um, great uh, national reference. Um, Representative Ziegler, you have a question? Uh, yes, and uh, since the bill hasn't been referenced yet, and I don't know if Senator Carney's has been referenced yet, but it'll probably go through the Energy and Utilities and Technology Committee. And as it stands now, uh, you know, there's obviously things could change, but it will pass. What we're hoping is it'll pass unanimous. Any bill passing unanimous will usually go under the hammer. Um, I don't know if there'll be bipartisan support in the committee, but I suspect it will pass in the committee and that means it will go to the floor uh, one way or another, either as a consent or, or we have a divided report. But I, I see it coming out of, out of committee as being passed, both of them for that matter. Um, I see a question. Uh, what is the plan if the national accelerator gets delayed or how would you segue to bonding? Um, and so that's a, that's a great question, Julia. Um, at this point, the bill um, does not include a source of funding. The, the legislation that Representative Ziegler has introduced um, with the anticipation of federal funding. And so it would just create the structure of the Green Bank as a new initiative underneath Efficiency Maine. Uh, but it does allow for the, the Green Bank initiative to receive other sources of funding. Um, clearly, we'd love to have 50 or $100 million flowing in from the, from the federal government. But if that doesn't happen, there's opportunities for local or national foundations to give donations uh, or, or grants to start it. Um, and it can accept other sources of funding as well. Um, and so uh, if, if this bill passes at the state level and the federal government uh, does not pass the national bill, um, then we'd probably try to move forward with a bond bill in the next legislative session um, to line up, bond, line up bond funding, and we'd try to seek out other sources of funding in the meantime so that things can, can get started and it, and it can become operational. Um, but it is a much, it's much more difficult to pass a funding bill through the state legislature 
And um, with, the, with the federal action, uh, it seems that urgency is prudent to get the bill passed and create the structure in Maine. Um, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that the federal government can keep functioning and passing legislation. Um, there's a question I see relating to regenerative agriculture and forestry. Um, and as the bill is currently drafted, it would allow for those types of projects um, with, with the intent that they are sequestering carbon and helping to address climate change. Um, the, the federal legislation specifically calls for regenerative agriculture and forestry as, as areas that it would fund. Um, I see, are there, are there any other countries who have adapted similar plans? Uh, yes, there, there are a number of green banks internationally. Um, I attended the International Green Bank Summit in New York City back in 2014, and it was attended by the, the president of the Japanese Green Bank, the head of the Australian Green Bank, um, the, the head of the UK Green Investment Bank, uh, I think there was a green bank entity in Malaysia um, and, and there's others that are starting in Australia and South Africa. Um, and uh, the UK Green Investment Bank was so successful that a private investment group bought them out and, and, and it was actually privatized uh, because they saw what the, what the market was and, and the success of that. Um, but while they were a publicly funded entity, they funded some of the largest offshore wind projects off the coast of Scotland. Um, and really jump-started offshore wind in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, I, at this point, I don't anticipate the main green bank funding that type of project, uh, but you know, that's in the realm of possibility for what green banks can do. So anything from small uh, efficiency retrofits to, to you know, much larger projects. Um, were there any other questions? Um, David, I, I would just, uh, can I just add to that last point that you made? I think I, I strongly agree with that. Um, you know, <laughs> utility scale renewable projects um, have, uh, the, the folks that are gonna be developing those projects have access to capital. The, the projects are quite large and quite expensive. Um, and so the, the funding that we're talking about is not really, <laughs> wouldn't really do that much. And I, I would also add to that list, um, you know, kind of major, major grid enhancements like transmission and distribution that might be needed to, to do that. And I think there's other ways to fund those things. So once again, as I said, targeting it at sort of the underserved markets that have limited access to capital is I think the, the best way to go about it. Yep, exactly. Um, well, it looks like we are approaching two o'clock. Um, so I wanna thank all of the panelists who joined us today. Um, and thank you all for attending. I really appreciate everyone taking an hour out of this gorgeous afternoon. Um, I think we'd all probably rather be outside enjoying the sunshine. So I hope you're able to get outside a little bit uh, while, while it's 65 and sunny out here. So thank you all and hope you have a great afternoon. And we will send an email follow-up um, to uh, include the, the links that we shared um, and there will be a recording of the meeting available as well.